So this month's topic, as we covered last week, is compelling conversations. And we wanted to kick off this episode where we're going to be diving into a fun article or a listicle here around how yes. to connect with people and really define what we mean by compelling conversations. What, what does that mean to you, Johnny? Well, it's, first of all, we want to get the doors open, and we've been talking about that. And I think if it goes back to the first impressions episode with our great first impression, it gives you a wide uh, window of opportunity. And then we had talked about getting things started and now uh, showing some interest, letting them know that you're curious about them, getting the conversation moving. And I think this is the opposite of small talk. Yeah. Right? When people think about conversations and and getting nervous about what to say and what not to say. A compelling conversation stands out, it makes you memorable, and it opens the door to connection. That's what we mean by compelling. I know a lot of times we overestimate what that means, and there's fireworks in our head, and it means saying the perfect things at the right time. That's not what we're talking about here. It's a window to vulnerability and connection. Well, it's an easy, it's easy to think that. It's always easy to think about, oh, this is where the magic is going to happen. But that magic is all the work that happens before, during, and after that allows that to stick. And so many people say, like, oh, if you see compelling conversations, it's easy to go, oh, this is the episode where they're gonna drop the secret of, of the memorable, amazing story that everyone should learn and everyone should pull out the rabbit out of the hat. And it's not as sexy as that. However, it can be, a lot of fun if you understand the working components from the nonverbals and the verbals. And allowing another person to share. Yes. A lot of times when we think compelling conversations, we think of our own pitch and what we're saying and, yeah. and how polished it has to be and how impressive it has to be. It's actually the opposite of that. And that's why we love this article. Well, think about it. If, if, it, if you're putting all the pressure on yourself to make this the magic happen, what we usually see, especially when we're doing video work, uh, and it's easy to get caught up in this, where you're just steamrolling and plowing over the other person because you have this thing that you've worked out, you're, re you're ready to roll, you know it works magic, it's worked that one time in the past. <laughs> and so every conversation goes, this comes out at some point. And of course, the other person, how the only thing that they're gonna remember, the only thing compelling about this is how to get out of it. All right, and where does this person even care what I have to think about this? And when we talk about conversations, it's it's a two-way street. Absolutely, and now we're adding some depth. It's not that surface, how's the weather, or what I like to do on my weekends, or what I do for work. We're taking it a level deeper. And today's article is Eight Insanely Effective Ways to Connect with Anyone You Meet. It's by Dr. Carrie Petzinger on Lifehack. We'll link it up in the show notes. If you have questions around compelling conversations, how to be more engaging, how to be more memorable, submit those for us to answer on the last episode of this month. In our Q&A episode, you can submit those to me, AJ at The Art of Charm, or on our social media channels, at The Art of Charm on Instagram and Twitter. We're happy to answer your questions on how to be more compelling, but what's really interesting about all of this is we're talking about how to get to connection. And I feel that a lot of us struggle with that because as Johnny was saying earlier, we have this script in our head of how it's supposed to go and we wanna tee things up to the best of our ability when in actuality, this is more of an art form. This is more of a, a dance in the conversation than blasting the other person with information. Well, I think there's also some, some toxic movie ideas of what it looks like as well, you know? You might see the movie where the the guy is really slick and he has he has this great story and she the, the other person is looking to him marveled in this in the in the story that's been created and he's laying out there and so we have in our head that we need to have that happen and you know that would be great but it's never just on us it's a conversation it's a two-way street there's two people participating and another misconception that we hear a lot is opposites attract we were just talking about this earlier uh, a lot of people look at me and Johnny as opposites on the surface level but in actuality we haven't seen that in, in our lives no. opposites don't attract and stick together opposites actually lose interest very quickly because what's going on below the surface is actually the more important stuff and what do we mean by that Johnny values traits ethics 
um, all the things that you care about most is what where the the attraction and the and the stick is going to be, and you know everyone can have their outside example, right? Of 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 oh well, here's two opposite people. Yeah, but if you look below, you're gonna find all the things that link them. Yeah, and those those beliefs, worldviews, morals, ethics are what have joined for me and Johnny and created that connection. It was not based on our music preferences. It's certainly not based on our sports <laughs> team preferences. But it's easy to get caught up in that surface level stuff. Like, oh, you know, he's into rock music, so am I. We like the same genre. Oh, we're gonna connect, we're gonna be friends. It actually happens much deeper than well, that. Well, you know, it's funny you should mention that. It's but it's because it's I think it's conversations that you and I would have with music or sports teams that are a lot of fun because there's so much disagreement there with all the other things that we do agree upon. So we're able to have these colorful conversations that, you know, I think that's what makes our conversation so compelling to others who who listen to the show or who marvel at the conversations that we'll have on perhaps on the the masterminds or dinner or dinners when we're doing networking stuff because they see us kind of maybe it can look to the untrained eye that we're squabbling right oh really not there's a lot of of give and take back and forth and and then throwing in the shots but it's i mean it's but it's all the other things that link us behind all that that makes those conversations so colorful and fun and we can throw shots at each other and not take it personally well i think we also respect competition true right and i think sports are one of those ways that it bubbles to the surface but you don't have to be into sports to enjoy competition i mean with the rise of e-gaming and and video games in general there are plenty of other ways than sports to compete with one another but our respective competition creates this colorful banter, these opportunities to push back and forth. And sometimes it can be a little jarring to the outsider of like, oh, AJ's digging into Johnny or vice versa. With all of that, the connection for us, going back to those worldviews and mindsets of growth and being into personal development, those are things that are happening below the surface that a lot of us aren't asking the right questions to bubble up to the top. And I think that's why when we hear opposites attract and, oh, it's all based on commonalities and similar interests, it's much deeper than that. So how do we start getting that connection? How do we actually get to that point? Well, the first point of the article here is pay attention. And I know we've <laughs> talked about this a lot on the show. When it comes to value, it's one of the easiest ways we can give someone value is to give them our attention. Well, to to go back to that episode, was it 694? 694. Uh, becoming high value. And when we talk about value, those three A's, attention, approval, and acceptance, go a long way in allowing people to feel good. And if you want to have a better idea of how that works, I would go back and listen to that that episode because it will it will allow you to understand how important paying attention is and why it is so effective in compelling conversations and listen in today's world it's hard to pay attention there are so many distractions we've joked about it before it's the attention economy you have businesses fighting for your attention marketers fighting for your attention friends family members co-workers all fighting for your attention and when you give someone your attention, it's meaningful. Mm -hmm. It allows the other person to feel fully committed to the interaction. Well, ask Google how important your attention is. Well, they actually have a number, <laughs> billions of dollars. <laughs> Absolutely, and so if they find it that uh, important, if Facebook finds it that important, if Instagram finds it that important, then your friends, family, and the people around you, your social circle, they should find it that important. They should value it just as much as those tech companies. And that's why they allow you to give those token moments of attention. I like this, I'll comment here, I'll interact there. It's all what they're doing is they're using our attention and they're monetizing it for their gain, but it is important and we all seek it as humans. And there are a ton of studies that demonstrate that active listening is one of the most crucial skills in conversation. Though it can be difficult, I think once you get the hang of it, and it's something that you bring a conscious effort towards, uh, you can become really good at active listening and it can, it can redefine how you look at conversations. And by just by being present, I know for a fact, when I walk into the podcast studio to do these episodes, 
I cannot be looking at my phone at least. I try to not to a, a, a half an hour before we come in here yeah. because I have to re get my brain to get uh, to get present. Because if not, I'm gonna be thinking of did I get another like on my last post? Like, how is that going to help me? What's going on in here? And I'll be honest, I still struggle with this. Huh? Like, it's not it's a skill that you're gonna work on your entire life because technology is fighting very hard for our <laughs> attention, and that's a battle. So. I don't always win the battle. I lose the battle sometimes. I have my phone, I'm flipping through things. Sure. I'm bouncing between Slack and Instagram and email and trying to keep up with everything going on in the business and answer the fans. But when we can unplug from that, which is why we do it on our mastermind events, we grab everyone's yes. phone. We grab everyone's phone in boot camp. When you can set your phone down and give a stranger your attention, well, that starts that compelling conversation. That allows the other person to feel valued. And let's go through some simple studies that back yeah. all of this up, right? We got a study here from Harry Wigger at the University of Central Florida. Active listening is more important in making people like you and making them feel understood than giving out well-meant advice or simple acknowledgement like I hear you. I mean, I hear you is probably one of the most frustrating responses to get in conversation, especially if you're being vulnerable. I love it when people are on their phone like, yeah, I hear you. No, you're not hearing anything. <laughs> In fact, saying I hear you is pretty much a universal signal. If I'm you not, didn't catch I'm anything. anything. It's a simple dismissal. And you can add, I feel you, bro. You can throw that one in there as well. Um, it's as good as cool story, bro, in, in my book. <laughs> I hear you. Well, you know, it's, it's a wonderful thing to know that just being present is going to go a long way. Because now you don't have to roll into the your mental Rolodex to try to figure out how you're going to counter what's happening. You being present, giving that person your attention is, is plenty. And it's easier than we think. As Johnny said, it's so easy for us to go cerebral, go straight to well, what am I going to say next? Or how does this link to this story? Or, or where have I heard that before? Or how can I connect on this? It's simpler than that. It's actually giving the other person a moment completely to speak their mind and allowing yourself to hear everything they're saying. Now, paraphrasing and perception checking is another essential verbal skill. Paraphrasing means repeating what the other person has said in your own words. And that gives the other person an opportunity to one, realize that you heard them. Yes. And two, an opportunity for further discussion. They could either agree with your perspective on what you just heard or they could disagree with it but that disclosure is how we start the ball rolling and start get compelling well one of the things that i've learned and i this this gives the value because it, not only that it shows that that you want to make sure that what you heard is correct and i love using the phrase listen i'm going to repeat back to you what you said just so i'm clear and if i am not please correct me Right, and that goes a long way. It, it shows the care, it shows the attention. Uh, and there's also, uh, they're approving there and, and, and in the conversation and what's being said so that we can move forward there. That's a lot. And it's the beginning of empathy. Yes. Right? It's the, the first step on that empathy train. Now, perception checking means telling the other person of your perception of what's going on and giving them a chance to agree or disagree. So paraphrasing is recapping what was said. Perception is now what your thoughts and feelings are about what's going on. Do you, uh, have you noticed in what we've just talked about right there, none of that happens in Twitter or Facebook? <laughs> have paraphrasing. You ever, have you ever seen, wait, let me, let me make sure I've got your post right because I'm a- Before I blast you. <laughs> in a, I want to say 240 characters now. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, there is none of that. It's what, and what's even, look at this, perception and paraphrasing. Half the time the arguments on Facebook is from an article title that is for clickbait that no one has even read who just want to go off. Let's oh. talk about. <laughs> How often have you clicked on those titles and been frustrated that your question wasn't answered? Uh, every day, at least five times. <laughs> so there you think attention's being sucked. Yeah. So. Paraphrasing and perception checking, essential verbal ways to showcase to someone we're present. Let's talk about some nonverbal ways to showcase we're present. Eye contact. Yes. 
when they're talking. So this is not at the start of the interaction. Now we've, we've moved from, hey, that small talk to, all right, now we're getting compelling. We're asking the other person to be vulnerable. So giving them our attention with some eye contact is important. Nodding along a slight yes. head bob so that people know that it's registering is a simple way to let them know you're present. Well, and you know, it's so funny. I've, I've seen and have been in so many conversations where the other person is just emotionless and it's, and I, you know, a lot of times to point that out, they don't even know that their stone emotionless face. Uh, and it's, we, we use a contribute that to some processing, right? We right. call it processing face. They're in their head. They're trying to, they're, they're giving you a lot of attention. They're, they're going through what you're saying in their mind, but because it, their face is emotionless, uh, you don't really know if you're getting through, if they even care what you're even saying. And listen, we do it with young children. We are emotive. We showcase emotion because we realize they might not be catching everything we're saying verbally. So it's important to showcase that positive emotional presence. Same thing with strangers. We're meeting for the first time. If you're stoic, if you're just not emotive at all, well, the other person can read that in a very negative way. Oh, I'm not interested in what you have to say. I'm not engaged. I could care less. So allowing the head nod, the eye contact, and some emotion to show on your face is huge. And then open body language. And how often do we see this, Johnny, where people will cross their arms, make themselves smaller, close yeah. off that body language from the other person? Well, <clears throat> It's such a simple thing too. William James and I, I talk about this all the time. William James, like it was like late eighteen seventies, puts posts a paper. You know how you move affects the way you think and feel. Now, if you're going to publish that, science is going to take you to task. Okay, well that's a nice idea. That's a nice hypothesis. We'll actually test that. And through uh, you know a hundred years of testing these ideas and these theories. Not only did science come to the conclusion that William James was correct, but they also had the data and science to point out that how you move affects the way you think and feel, and your brain will produce the chemicals to back up those thoughts and feelings. So ideas such as fake it till you make it, or act as if, which I think we'll be talking about in a minute here, um, go a long way. And this is when we come back to, it's easier to act your way into thinking than to think your way into acting. All the quick wins in self-development, if you want to start feeling better about things and gaining some control, come through body language. And then once you can get that corrected and start getting some wins and start feeling good, then you can go to the head and start working on all the, the much more difficult things and all the circular thinking, the flawed thinking, cognitive distortions, a lot of those types of ideas that are going to need your body language to help break through some of those cir the circular thinking. And allowing the other person to feel that attention through your nonverbal communication is important. We all notice the universal signals of disinterest. So <laughs> if we can start to showcase more active interest in our body language, well, the other person is going to feel more comfortable opening up and moving to that compelling conversation. Yeah, I think every guy who's listening to this knows the signs of disinterest really, really well. <laughs> we've seen him a few times if we're out there taking some shots for sure. Yeah, it's so funny. It's like we've seen them so much we start looking for them even when they're not there, which once again, this is why I was talking about breaking that circular thinking because you you will see what you're looking for, whether it's there or not. And science does show that we are terrible at active listening. Oh, yes. There's a study from Dick Lee at the University of Missouri who said, basically, you can think faster than someone else can speak. Mm -hmm. So most of us speak at a rate of 125 words per minute while we have a mental capacity of 400 words a minute. So we're going to be filling in the other 275 with our own words very often our own words yes. can muck up our ability to be attentive, to be present. Well, it goes back to the lens in which you view the world and, and what has colored that lens from either rose colored to crap colored. So, <laughs> uh, and, and the other thing, you know, it's funny that you mentioned this because one of the things that I had spent my time on, on our break I, while I was in Portugal, and both of us had an opportunity to go do some traveling and and for myself this was the first time that i was going to be alone for a while and i wanted to use it to my 
to my advantage and do something that I've never done before. So having a journal and journaling the stream of consciousness and then, and then diving into some of the fleshing, some of those thoughts out that I found, uh, uh, more interested, more interesting. And it's funny because yes, I can think or speak 125 words per minute. Uh, but when you're writing out all your thoughts and then fleshing them out, it is, it's, interesting to know those 400 words that are going on when you're starting to write them yeah it doesn't come out that fast no and you start to realize the all the the what'd you say 275 that you're coloring in with what those are what the lens is that those are made of and it's through being able to journal that stream of consciousness and look at it objectively and how big of an impact your emotional state has on it <sighs> Right. I'm sure your stream of consciousness is a little different when someone cut you off in traffic or your Uber driver was tossing you around in the back seat. Well, to be able to ask yourself the question why multiple times on a thought and follow it all the way through to its root is I don't. Well, when do we get to do that anymore? Like you have to actively give yourself uh, time to you have to allow yourself time to do that. I think it happened once. It was a, a brownout <laughs> that hit the east coast of the U.S. where no one had internet or power. And why? And then we got to the fifth why. <laughs> Hopefully you answered it. The second point made in the article is seeking feedback. And, and how many of us try to avoid this and try to push our own agenda and our own perfection and it, our own successes on other people instead of allowing other people to give us some feedback, allowing other people to color in a little bit what's going on. And listen, we now know that we're terrible at active listening. We're, we struggle with being attentive. Yes. And we're listening to this podcast because we want to improve. So getting some feedback on our ability to communicate is helpful. Well, in order to do that, to in order to elicit feedback, you must be open to the idea that there's feedback to and there's get. room to grow that you can improve. And now, if you've been listening to this podcast for any amount of time and decided to share it with some friends, you might have found some pushback because all of a sudden you're handing them something about self development. And you know, as 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 far as self development has gained some strides in the last ten years, I st it still carries a bit of a stigma. Well, what do you need to fix about yourself but if you're at anyone who wants to to get better at anything you have to be open that you can and it's start you know we talk about the dunning-kruger effect all the time and it's even listed here and and it's the phenomena that people of lower intelligence tend to beat their chest about things that they don't they don't know about where the people of higher intelligence know what they don't know and can, will be a bit humble. Often, yeah, they'll underestimate their underestimate their abilities. their abilities of things they don't know because they know what they don't know. And how can you get better at a thing like compelling conversations if you're not willing to accept feedback? And one of the things that I and I have to credit you for this because you've definitely helped me understand feedback uh, through our years of doing business, and it is something that I look for now. But it's not always welcome. Right? No. It's, it's not always uh, you're not always excited to get it because it might not be what you want to hear. However, uh, how much stronger are you? Again, those receive? learning moments are coming from feedback. And, and here's the thing. When we seek advice from strangers, it leads to compelling conversation. It yes. gives them an opportunity to share their opinion. It allows the spotlight to go on them. We're not stealing the spotlight, demanding their attention. And oftentimes people will give unsolicited advice. They like that moment. They relish that moment. So if you want to start a compelling conversation with someone, seek some feedback on what you're doing and allow them an opportunity to mentor you, give you some advice. And that's what the, the author is saying here with going to Toastmasters, going to improv, two things that we talk a lot about with yes. our boot camp participants. The training of getting better conversationally doesn't just stop with Oh, I tried it a couple times. Oh, I worked on it for the last month and I'm good. It's an ongoing thing to understand how to communicate more effectively, more efficiently and engaging. You need to be talking to lots of people. I, you know, it's, it's funny. I think you have to find opportunities to get your ass kicked 
in order to accept feedback well, right? Like improv, they're not always going to be, you're not always going to be the best on the day. You're going to go for some stuff. It's going to fall flat on your face, but you're going to get better. Like, uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, BJJ. Basically, you're going to get your to get your ass kicked, and then because of that, you're going to learn from it. And everyone who is open to those ideas has the fast track of betterment. Absolutely. And seeking feedback outside of in conversation, but in life, is probably why you're listening to the show. You want to grow as an individual, and outside feedback and perspective allows that to happen. The third point the author makes here, which dovetails nicely into our conversation formula is asking questions. We talked about this on the last episode and how, or how important absolutely and asking the right questions, allowing the other person to talk about themselves, yes. which is their favorite topic. And when we give them that opportunity, going back to point number one, we add some attention in there. Oh my God, this is a killer combination. You just, you said it, a killer combination. You're showing interest. Uh, you're asking questions. They now have an opportunity to talk about their favorite subject and you're giving them value in doing that. So you've also gave them value in the beginning of your showing interest. So there's like how much value are you throwing in their direction uh, just by allowing them to talk about themselves. And that's why I love the conversation formula, asking a question, listening to their answer and always responding in the form of a statement illustrates that giving them an opportunity to share, being attentive and listening, and then disclosing something, being a little vulnerable, putting out your opinion, sharing something with them, that is a powerful way to get the conversation moving in a direction that's not boring small talk. And for everyone out there who, let's just, and we hear this all the time, I, the, the, what we hear is, I find at times I run out of things to say. Well, that's one wrong way of looking at it because it's just you running your mouth right <laughs> but two there's only so many questions that you can ask to get the other person talking be before it just gets weird or the conversation collapses on itself so and this is why the conversation formula is so important so that when you ask the question they give an answer and you're now you've gotten all the information you need to to tee up something that is sharing about yourself now yeah, that disclosure is so often lacking when we get stuck on the question train, where we just ask question after question, almost stealing information from the other person until they're like, this guy's not paying attention to me. This guy's not doing step one. Now, number four is also challenging. I'm not gonna lie, we, we joke about this a lot. We only have so much memory in the, the database to remember names, so a lot of guys will ask us, hey, how, how do you remember a name if someone offers up their name? I try not to go for the name until I have something memorable about their personality or something else to latch onto with that name. Exactly. I, you know, there was there's a fun game that the improv uh, girls always put with Aaron and Suzanne. They always come in and they do this game where everyone has to make up a name, but it's actions. Right? And I... From the very first time I ever played that improv game, I still can go around the room and remember everyone's action because it was burned into my brain and because it was so much fun. Right. So, you know, if you can tie that name to, as, as you mentioned, as a, an action or a memorable moment, it's going to go a lot easier for you. Repeating it Repe as as awkward as it may sound in the beginning, repeating it a few times as you get the conversation going helps quite a bit. Associating definitely helps. Mm -hmm. We had a, a wonderful tour guide in Iceland. We did a, a walking food tour. We had some lamb, hot dogs, some amazing meat soup. Great. And her name, her name was Goodney. Yep. And everyone was asking, what, how do you say that again? And it, I said, bad knee, good knee. And immediately everyone remembered her name. And all the guys who are in Iceland listening now can definitely remember yes. it because we associated it with something else that we knew, right? So sometimes these names that are a little tricky that are not usual for you, Goodney's not a typical American name. I think it's probably a typical Icelandic name. Associating it with something else that gives you that ability to pronounce it is very helpful. Let me ask you this. When do you feel, when do you start to feel bad? How many times before you forget somebody's name do you start to feel bad? Like if, if I have to ask a third time, I feel like it, just a complete asshole. I'd say three is pretty <laughs> much, yeah. <laughs> Unless I've consumed a fair amount of alcohol. 
uh, and I have some sort of plausible deniability for such ignorance. Yeah, three yeah. is yeah, three is the max. But I I try not to push for the name in the very beginning. No, when you're working on it's talking too, with a lot it's of people, too much. and that's the, here's the opportunity to make sure you're giving them your active listening, so right. that you can find those moments that will burn a picture or a moment in your mind that you can attach a name to. And Dale Carnegie said it best. Everyone's favorite sound is their own name. <laughs> when you are using a person's name, they are going to remember you. So that is a way to get that compelling conversation. Now, number five kind of goes along with, uh, I believe, number two, which was getting some feedback. Number five here is don't pretend you know everything. How many times have you been in a conversation that's uncompelling with someone just bloviating about how much they know, how much they've read, how many videos they've seen, and how they have all the answers to your problems? I thought that, is that a, just an L.A. thing? <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty well traveled. Yeah. And I've felt it everywhere, everywhere. I've been. <clears throat> I think it's it's one of the best things that you can do. For, I th that goes with the Dunning-Kruger effect, right? It's just like... First of all, you sh you should be comfortable in knowing what you don't know so that you're able to ask questions, so you're able to get better, so you can learn about other people, rather than, as, as, as you mentioned, bloviating about everything under the sun just for the sake of hearing your own voice. Uh, and stating to someone how much you know or trying to vocalize how intelligent you are, how well-read you are, is always a bad look. Well, here's the... You can continue to talk about all those things that you just mentioned, but the more you're doing that, you're not convincing anybody. No. And in, in fact, the more you're talking, the it's easier for you to talk yourself out of any of those things. Yeah, I, I love this idea of a spotlight effect. Yeah. When I'm meeting someone, I'm putting the spotlight on them. Let they're them the star, they're the expert. Allow them to bloviate, pontificate, and celebrate themselves. But if you come into a conversation wanting to puff your chest out, wanting to talk about all these different amazing things that you've done or you've seen or you've read, you're actually going to lose the other person's interest, and that is not a compelling conversation. And we never connect on people's perfections. It just no. doesn't happen. So we always connect through the rougher parts, those vulnerabilities, those things that are imperfect. Well, it, it says a lot about the person you're speaking to because you know what they're made of, so then you can lean in on them a bit. And understanding that when we puff our chest up and we try to go for I'm Mr. Perfect, no one else is going to feel comfortable in that setting. When you are willing to share your imperfections, you're saying it's okay to be imperfect. Everyone feels more comfortable in that setting. Well, when I hear those, those stories of messing up or learning, all that says to me is that person is willing to put themselves in those situations. That and, takes courage. And, That's not easy. It takes courage. And if they're willing to tell you how they failed in that situation, then you also know that they've gotten through it, that they were able to learn from it. If all they're speaking about is the triumph, then was there any, did they get anything out of it? It's unrelatable. Been, I don't know where this popped into my head, but I've been saying it so much lately. You have to be able to get yourself in trouble in order to find your way out. And I, that's just the truth of it. Well, we've, we've met a lot of people who don't know how to find their way out of trouble. No, no. Inexperience will lead you into that predicament. <laughs> Number six here, care about others. Nothing else matters if you don't act like you care about those around you. I mean, being careless does not make you compelling. Being careless, forgetful, and not, again, going back to point one, attentive, is a turnoff to people. It's not going to be memorable in a good way. Well, one of my favorite things about that is in order for you to to build and maintain a social circle that is going to support and encourage your attempt at being your best, you're going to have to learn how to care about others for them to care about you and and put you in that situation. We all know that we cannot achieve the everything that we want, including being our best selves without the help of caring others. We are built on community. And if, if we can't showcase that we care about other people, we're going to be isolated. We're going to be lonely and understanding that we don't need grand gestures here. 
but giving people a thank you when they've done you a favor, when they've helped you in conversation, uh, giving people some gratitude, allowing people around you to feel that you are considerate is important and it allows other people to be compelled to talk to you more, to feel connected to you. And we all love being appreciated. Every single one of us loves being appreciated, which is why it's the second part of value. Going back to episode 694, I know we've used value a lot in this episode. If you are wondering what we mean by value, that's a deeper dive. But attention, appreciation, hand in hand in giving someone value. Well, I know there's lots of things that I wouldn't have done if it wasn't egged on by someone in my social circle. I uh, Right now... I'm in the middle of training for a half marathon that I had no plans on taking on till you <laughs> brought <Sorry. it> up. <laughs> However, it was a, it was an easy pitch, right? You're like it's the 28th of October and I'm like, "Wow, oh, well, if my birthday's the 29th, I'm 45." Yeah, it's a big one. It's a big, it's a notable one. Uh I'm, I'm in. And uh you know, it's funny because I remember this morning, when we were getting, when we were with our trainer, getting our asses handed to us, I was like cursing. This whole idea I of was half marathon, <laughs> yeah. We've entered the conditioning phase. Yes. And uh, we actually, we, we posted up to the family that it's happening, so now we have all of the accountability. Remember yeah. our accountability episode? Absolutely. Identifying the goal, sharing it with others, and now we have a bunch of people joining us here in LA on the half marathon. We'll post a link under this in the show notes under this episode for you to check out the rock and roll marathon in LA. If any of you show listeners want to join us on a half marathon and uh, compete against your favorite show host, you can check it out (laughs) below. You know, it was a part of that, you know, it's, I, the only thing I keep thinking just how amazing that beer is going to taste after that's going to be the best beer ever. I mean, for all the work of months and the the sweat and the tears and the blood and the I'm guts. still trying to figure out how I'm crossing the finish line. So you're already, you're dancing I'm in the already, end zone. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to get there. But I'm starting my training and, and getting my uh, miles logged. Well, another thing about this, right? Why did I get involved? Well, you mentioned it was something that you wanted to do, right? And so, of course, I want to see you do things that you want to do. I want to see you. Uh, test and and put yourself out uh, in in that in the un, in the uncomfortable situation and of course you know I look for those opportunities as well I know um, some of you guys have mentioned David Goggins uh, when in your letters to us and we are looking to get him on the show I think we got made, we're making it happen um, you know it it was something when I see his posts I get fired up there's like there's between him and Jocka, there's so many times where I'll wake up in the morning and I'm like, I don't feel it. Right? And I see like David Goggins flipping a tire for like a mile and I'm like, all right, I'm getting up. Yeah, time, <laughs> time to do something that I hate. <laughs> but here again, uh, a- another opportunity to uh, bond and cement our relationship even further of putting ourselves both out there uncomfortable place. Uh, yeah, something- neither one of us are runners. No, no. And, uh, but it's, it's, you know, as much as I was cursing your name this morning, I, it's, it's going to be, it's good. It's going to be fun. It, the whole thing's been fun so well, far. We've just got started. Yeah, I mean, this, this whole year has been <laughs> built around change for us and improving our health is a big part of dealing with a lot yes. of the stress that comes along with change. And as I was sitting there in Barry's logging another three miles in class on the treadmill, I was like, all right, I guess I run now. So what can I do to kick it up a lot? Yeah, of course. And when we first moved to LA, uh, nine years ago now we did a 5k yeah and it was fun it was doable so I, I didn't feel like 5k is challenging enough so we kicked it up to a half marathon we'd love to have some of our fans uh, join us here in LA for the marathon I say well if, if they're interested they should write us but like, I'm coming we're doing it all right you could write me Johnny at the art of charm.com and AJ at the art of charm.com we'd love to know if you guys want to run with us now showing appreciation is a skill set showing that you care others is a skill set and a a ritual a habit that we have to build over time and it's one of the reasons that we built the challenge so we have a challenge facebook group with i believe now it's a few challenges to get you moving socially you check it out theartofcharm.com challenge but one of those challenges is all around this idea of 
creating a habit of giving appreciation to others, allowing other people around you to feel appreciated, whether they're friends, family, coworkers, or absolute strangers. When you work on this habit and build out this skill set, it opens a world of doors. And as we can see here, it also creates that space for compelling conversation. Well, <clears throat> you know, I don't have those studies in front of me, but they've been done in a million times of how it allows you to feel better. I believe there's a whole section in Adam Grant's book about appreciation. Give right? and take. Give and take. And, and, and part of our uh, ritual with the family is on Wednesdays, we have appreciative Wednesdays where everyone gets to post up you know, who and what they're appreciative for in, in that day. It's a very healthy habit to have mentally. When you get focused on how can I appreciate others, you stop looking internally and yes. focusing on all of your warts and all of your issues, but instead celebrate others. It creates a powerful, virtuous cycle that people around you start to get conditioned that you treat them well, you make them feel good. So I want to make AJ feel good. And all of a sudden you're getting it mirrored back at you. Number seven, see it as a room full of friends. And I talk about this on day one, how important attitude is in our confidence. And mm -hmm. when we feel like we are lacking some confidence, especially socially, it's easy for introverts and those of us with social anxiety to lack confidence socially. Well, it's very easy for us to see and picture and visualize all the ways we're going to fail. Mm -hmm. All the ways that people are gonna find us uninteresting, boring, lame. But well, science has shown yeah. that people with confidence before an event, before a str potential stress, they see all the ways that things can go in their favor. They see success, they visualize success. Well, let's talk about success socially. Visualizing it as a room full of friends and not strangers who are gonna judge you or find you awkward, but instead viewing the room as a bunch of people that are already my friends, well, that's a great visualization to start with. Yeah, um, we have Edgar Guess as a, as a as a poet, and in 1915 he had wrote, there are no strangers here, only friends you haven't met yet. I've heard that saying many times, and it's a, it's a great one. But you also have to train yourself to think in that manner, because certainly, if you have anxiety, that's one thing. You're already starting from a place of fear, but just in, in, in a natural state, if you haven't put yourself in that position many times, it's easy to feel judgmental because you're uncomfortable. And so all of us have to come from that place when we're uncomfortable, we have to then rationalize why we're uncomfortable. And the easiest thing to say is, well, because everyone here is dressed funny and they're, they're pretentious and they're hipsters and they're this and they're that. Yeah, put them in the out group, that's right. the easiest. Boom, now they're out there and now you can justify feeling the way you do. And then, but the thing that happens out of that is once you've put them in the out group, so your body language is usually going to exhibit that as well, which only forces them in a position to mirror that back. And now you have that thought reinforced. And now you have those people looking at you uh, as an out group and you're looking at them as the out group. Now you cannot have a good evening with two opposing forces right. looking at it in that manner. And Listen, instilling a new mindset is not easy. This whole mindset of view it as a room full of friends can be difficult when we don't have very many friends and connections and we don't feel that people judge us properly or that we can make a good first impression. And a TEDx speaker, Kelly McGonagall, Kelly McGonagall talks about how to effectively manipulate and, and change your mindsets. And it's really a three-step process. Number one is simply learning the new perspective, which is what we're doing now. We're mm -hmm. listening to this new idea, this new concept of view the room as it's a room full of friends instead of a room full of strangers. So we learned a new perspective. Now, we have to do it as an exercise. Go out there after writing down this mindset, go out there and practice it. Pretending yes. people are your friend already. Treating everyone like a friend instead of treating them like a stranger. And the third thing you have to do to make this mindset stick with all of her research is you have to share it with other people. How great is that? It's pretty awesome. Yeah. It's remarkable. You learn it, you practice it, then you share sure. it with other people and all of a sudden that new mindset sticks. How empowering is it when you walk into the room and feel that everyone is already your friend? Well, you're coming, you're, as you mentioned, you're coming from a place of power. And most importantly though, when we hear something like this, it, 
some of us could get rather excited. I know that in the beginning of my stages of really getting into self-development, I would hear mindsets like that and I would want to go out. But then I, then I get there, then I get there and I see the, all the overwhelming feelings start to hit because the mindset is everyone there is my friend. Okay. Well then I should be able to talk to everybody in this room. Well, now the expectations oh, yeah. now. are just ridiculous because now I have to run the room in order for me to feel that this mindset is now taking place. It is a process. We have, we have to go out now with this mindset, with obtainable goals that allow us to slowly uh, it to seep in. It's not going to be, I listen to everyone out there. I would love for these mindsets to be a light switch and some can be. But most not. Right. And this this is a tricky one when we're coming from a place of scarcity where maybe we don't have very many friends. We have some acquaintances. We're trying to get things moving and burn off some of that social anxiety. But as Kelly pointed out for us, if we learn it, write it down, practice it, and start sharing it with others, it becomes a mindset that we can adopt more easily. Eight, the eighth and final point in our article here is connecting in person. And we get this question so often. I, I had a you know, short conversation with someone. What's the best way to follow up? How can I connect? I want, yeah. I want to lengthen this relationship. We get questions about how do I get on Tinder and, and get her more connected. Everyone is trying to rely on technology in mm -hmm. places where technology do not foster actual connection. Well, there's a reason. So let's dig into that reason. Why are we not connecting through technology why are we connecting in person because if i connect in person then it might not go so well and then i'm going to be hurt and then there's gonna, risk there's risk i and and let's just let's just go ahead and say it. it's not going to happen through an app the connection is not going to happen well, right. through there's technology a, there's a phrase for it catfishing came out of this Ugh. It's so easy to create a fake persona online and hide behind it and manipulate other people. But when we're doing it in person, we are present, we are there, that is compelling. Mm -hmm. No compelling conversations are happening on WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger or in Tinder. You have to meet in person in order for it to be compelling. It almost sounds common sense, but how many of us revert to technology because it's easier. Oh, I can pause. I can send a text with an emoji. It's so everyone much more likes to think they figured it out. You haven't figured it out. It's not going to happen. It it's, it's sorry. It's just science. It's going to happen in person. And the funny thing is, have you ever had a conversation with somebody that you've never met before on Tinder, on Facebook, and then you meet them in person and you're really excited because you guys have been talking for sharing vulnerable, you, you cover topics no one else knows. And then it's just it's crickets. And you know, I'll go ahead and say, I recently just had a date situation that went this you way. You got catfished? No, I did not get catfished, Okay, but it was somebody who for just the way the, it, it just happened. We had been texting for a few months, texting, um, social yeah, media. Yeah, you were saying you just, you couldn't connect at the same time and place. Yeah, so, but there's all the pictures online. She knows who, what I look like. I know what she looks like. We've been chatting. We've had great conversations. There was even a couple uh, um, uh, live phone calls. Uh, and, and Real live phone calls? Real you were using your phone? Well, video conference calls or whatever I, say, I, I don't think I've ever seen you hold your phone up to your head so she was off one weekend I was off one weekend and she's like hey you know <clears throat> I'm off I was looking for something to do how about if I come out and visit I'm like all right yeah and it wasn't it wasn't like we were moving towards a romantic thing anyway it was just all just friends we we're just talking we we're just yeah. bullshitting but she hey she wants to come hang out that's right I was off and we made some plans and she drove out and I it, remember I checked in. Yeah, because I told you, I'm like, hey, I don't know if I'm going to be able to work this weekend. I got this girl coming in and all this. And uh, and you're like, all right. And I was like, yeah, we'll see what happens, you know. And uh, and of course, I was excited. And it, for whatever reason, the conversations were flat. And she had the gall. I know. This was seriously offensive to Johnny. Yeah, she goes, why do you work out so much? Now, 
And I was like, and she's like, I could never do that. And I was like, well, we start, how are we even starting off this, this get together weekend with a comment and a conversation like that? Yeah, I think the the question gives you an opportunity to explain a little bit more of your background, but then the I could never do that right. has the judgment placed on it where it's like, uh, I'm not sure I want to answer this question. It was in that moment that I was like, I'm like, okay, so this is hour one and she's going to be here on a <laughs> Sunday. But the, this is what's great about this. And I, you were laughing, I was telling you. I think it was about three hours later she goes, so yeah, if I might get a call and I might have to go back for work. And I was like, she's looking for an exit. This is great because I don't want to deal with her anymore either. She got my weekend back. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and the, the funny, the weird thing about it is like how it, it the whole thing was odd to me because we had such a decent relationship online. We were talking. It was we talked freely. We're sending pictures. You know, it's like it was just to me, the whole thing was just weird. But. What I couldn't get is like, first of all, how could you ask me, why do you work out so much? And the other part about it, it's not like, you know, it's not like I am David Goggins. It's not like I'm Joe Rogan. You know, I, I go to the gym for an hour and I'm out. Well, also, it, it, there are less attractive things you can do than work out. Yeah. So a <laughs> little, little perplexed by that. Why do you care so much about your health? Yeah. Uh, I enjoy I, my time here. I don't know. And, and that's, listen, that's, you know, it's, that's probably a relatively new thing in the last five, six years where I've really put in a lot of efforts. Hey, on Johnny, it. maybe opposites attract. I think you should give her a second chance. Yeah, that, that, that ship has sailed. <laughs> <laughs> well, going back to the point, connecting in person is so incredibly important. It gives you an opportunity to non-verbally and verbally communicate and be fully present. We know that technology does not foster that presence. When you're sending that text, you got your Facebook tab open, you're clicking through your inbox, you're not present, you're not really caring, and emojis can only get you so far. Even if you're an emoji ninja, it yeah. can only get you so far. So connecting in person is where that compelling conversation happens. Now. We hit you with eight points around how to be more connected and compelling in conversation, but we want to add some perspective. We got this great article that recently came out in The Atlantic, How to Make Friends According to Science. And I think the reason I like this article so much is it, it should take some of the pressure off. Mm -hmm. And we, we started talking about this at the start of the show. You know, everyone in their mind, when they hear compelling conversation, they have that Hollywood movie scene teed up where they met each other, they had an amazing conversation right out of the gate, and then they instantly were attracted, instantly were connected. Science shows it takes a number of hours to be a quote unquote real friend to someone. It is not easy to move from the acquaintance into the friend, into the confidant category. We're talking hours and hours and hours here. But what science also says is don't give up on those acquaintances. Yeah. Those acquaintances are the first step to friendship. So. What I love about this article is we don't have to hit a home run in every conversation. Build acquaintances, start getting more opportunities in the mix, and all of a sudden you're going to create a space for that compelling conversation that can move the acquaintance to a friend. Well, I think we've talked about this in many other episodes. When, when you have a lot of options, the pressure it, it dissipates and you don't have to put it on that one situation. If you're, if you're not somebody who goes out and has a lot of acquaintances, then the one time that you do get to meet somebody, and especially if it's somebody that you're romantically interested in, you have all the pressure to, yes, make it work, to have this amazing conversation, to hit the home run right out of the park. And unfortunately, that's just not realistic. And here's the best part. Interacting with people whom you have a week tie with a weak social tie has a meaningful influence on your well-being on your mental health so even if you don't have deep friends you don't have a wolf pack you don't have that deep connection yet you're struggling with compelling conversations working on acquaintances can 
impact your well-being, can give you that positive emotional state and environment so that you don't feel loneliness, you don't feel depressed. So building acquaintances first is scientifically proven to help your mental health. Well, it, once again, it goes against all the technology in a rapid, hey, I want this, click this, and I got it, where we have to allow nature to do its job. And unfortunately, we can't just pay for it or click a button to allow that to happen. Uh, time needs to do time. And here's the thing. Reviving dormant social ties. We just hit you with a bunch of knowledge over the last two weeks about compelling conversations. Hit up those people that you fell out of touch with, that maybe you had a weak tie, you had a connection that was fleeting. Reach back out to them. Reviving those dormant social ties can be especially rewarding. Reconnecting with friends, as the author says here, can quickly recapture much of the trust they previously built while offering each other that dash of novelty so that all of a sudden you caught up with each other and now you can practice some of these compelling conversation skills you learned over the last two weeks. Reaching out to people, developing acquaintances everywhere you go gives you more opportunity to build those deeper relationships. And ultimately, I know it's easy on social media to see other people with all of these friends, all of these oh, God. <laughs> close friends in their community. Science shows that realistically, we can only maintain five close friends. I know the TV shows like to make you believe you need 30, 40 friends to be a well-rounded human. You focus on getting some acquaintances and moving them through to real friends, and you focus on making sure that you're present for the people that you care the most about. That's a winning combination. You know, I was just doing a Facebook Live for, um, I think it was on the challenge, yeah. actually. Uh, the, which you alluded to earlier, we'll drop the link. And <clears throat> I was surprised uh, how many young people get so wrapped up in that number that you had just mentioned, because it, you know it is it it seems to be moving. Uh, well, at least it moves things in social media, but that's just but that's virtually that's a virtual reality. That's not r real life. And s someone was mentioning about. You know, how long did it take me to build a social circle that I felt good about? And it's like, well, social circles are fluid. There's going to be people in and out of your life and, and, and your top eight. <laughs> yeah, especially if days. you're growing, you're moving, you got things going on. People get married, people's careers take off, life happens, and that's fine. You have to allow for that to happen for yourself and everyone else. But the main thing is what I told that person, was don't think about how long it's going to take. Let's just focus on one. You get one good person in your life that everything else falls in the place. And that's all it takes. And once you have one good friend that you can do a lot of things with and uh, grow with, uh, I mean, the rest is easy. And all of those friendships started as acquaintances. Yes. Remember that. You don't need to beat yourself up if all you have right now is some surface weak social ties. Those are still the seedlings that create those lasting bonds and friendship. And here's the thing. If you're struggling even with that, getting just some acquaintances, start with some self-disclosure. The article wraps up with self-disclosure makes us more likable. And as a bonus, we're more inclined to like those who we've buried, who we've bared our soul to. So not only does it give you a little boost of confidence and creates a window of opportunity for that compelling conversation, self-disclosure also naturally makes you like the people you disclose to more. So if you're finding yourself in a negative rut where you're judgmental, you're being a jerk to people, you're writing people off, start by self-disclosing a little bit, being a little more vulnerable. Scientifically, you'll be more open to that connection. Love that.